I'm Katie Teitler, Senior Analyst with TAG Cyber, and I'm here today with Dr. Alexander Yampolsky, our friend Alex, CEO and founder of Security Scorecard. Alex, thank you so much for joining me. Katie, it's a pleasure to be with you. We're going to talk a little bit about cybersecurity today and risk. So cybersecurity is a four-level topic, and businesses, regardless of their industry or size, cannot afford to ignore cyber risk anymore. A risk turn compromise could affect the company's operations, financials, brand. But that said, between internal assets and connected assets, the supply chain, unmanaged devices, shadow IT, the growing attacker community, and on and on, it's exceptionally difficult for businesses to understand their risk posture and keep it current on a day-to-day -day basis. Everything is changing with companies' digital assets, and the difficulty is compounded when it comes to third parties like suppliers and partners whose systems aren't under a specific business's direct control. However, we've obviously seen in the industry that third party systems can cause mega breach. It, it, it's happened a number of times. We won't call out any specific companies, but we know it happens and a risk an idea of a company's risk, having a good grasp of what that is, is one of the best ways for companies to understand and then manage the risk. It's not just about knowing it, it's about managing it. But Alex, there are so many things that go into developing a risk score, which is why obviously you started Security Scorecard. And a scorecard could be seen as subjective. So Alex, what are some of the elements that go into creating a security risk score for a company, and how do you ensure that subjectivity is taken out of the equation? Sure, so that's a great question. So at Security Scorecard, our mission is to make the world a safer place, just like credit ratings were invented uh, to measure how trustworthy businesses are to lend money to each other. We invented the concept of security ratings, which measures cybersecurity resilience completely from outside for any company in the world. In order to make sure that the ratings are objective, uh, you have to be transparent with your methodology. So we published our methodology uh, publicly to the entire world at trust.securityscorecard.com, as well as we published the KPIs about the accuracy of a methodology, and we worked with a number of outside firms to go validate it. But kind of in short, uh, when we're trying to measure cybersecurity uh, hygiene of any company in the world, there are basically three steps in the process. In step one, we pick up different signals non-intrusively from outside from over 45 co-located locations worldwide. We pick up over 7 100 million malware infections every single day and over 27 billion vulnerabilities each week. The data is gathered from multiple data sources in parallel in order to make sure that you correlate those data sources where we get the data and make sure that the signals are all trustworthy. In, in part number two, we discover the network topology or attack surface of the company. So we mapped over one and a half million companies in a data set 10 times more than anybody else. And then finally, in step, step number three, we apply a fair, accurate, and predictive scoring model, which is based on seven years of historical data that we collected. So for example, what we do is, suppose that a financial company, like a small financial company, has 20 malware infections uh, within their system. We don't know if it's good or bad. We're going to compare to other small financial companies and say, what's the median? number of malware infections for those companies of that size. How many standard deviations is 20 away from the median? Maybe everybody else has 40 and you have 20. In that case, you're actually better than everybody else. So we compare companies within the industry to each other to understand what the median is. We see how far alone from a median the uh, each signal is. And then by sitting on seven years of historical data, we know which signals are more predictive and less predictive of a data breach. We published the model, it's publicly available for commentary and feedback. Transparency is tantamount to uh, trust and objectivity of a scores. And we've shown, and it was proven and validated by other companies, that companies with a bad security scorecard grade 
a DONF are five and a half times more likely to suffer a data breach than companies with a good score. So there's a whole lot of data collection, correlation, aggregation, and analysis. And it seems like it's not just focused on what's happening, but history and predictive analytics as well. Correct, absolutely, yes. Yes, yeah, so that there's there's a lot going on there, but for a lot of companies that we talk to in the enterprise, some of them feel like they can develop their own risk calculators based on what they have, the data they're collecting, because most companies, most enterprises have huge amounts of technology, huge amounts of data. The problem may be the experience in actually creating a risk score, the accuracy. So what are some of the differentiators in your rating system from these homegrown systems, or maybe even from other tools, open source perhaps on the market? Well, there are a lot of hard components that go into the system, uh, but at a high level, we're sitting on seven years of historical data. Right, every time a company suffers a data breach, we go and check what aspects of a score were more predictive and less predictive. And then every time a company gets rated by security scorecard, they're able to provide commentary, they're able to provide additional feedback on the score, on the insights that we delivered, and our technology gets smarter as it consumes more data. So just like when you use Google, and Google learns what advertising you click on, what's re more relevant, what's less relevant. Similarly, our AI technology gets smarter as it consumes more data from the seven years of historical data, from the feedback loop from the rated companies, and that's really the barrier to entry. Anybody can go come up with a scoring system. It's very easy to come up with a score, but they're not going to have the seven years of historical data. They're not gonna have the one and a half million data set that we collected. Um, and so that would really be the barrier to entry. Now, for companies to in develop internally risk models and scoring models, I'm actually a really big fan of it. Like, I think it's actually a great idea. A lot of different enterprises use different methodologies, including FAIR methodology and other type of methodologies to compute internal risk. And I think it's a good endeavor because they're different models that you can build and develop. Um, and I see the scores that we provide as additional input models into those other scoring techniques that companies might do internally, right? Just like if if a bank is thinking about giving you a loan, it's gonna look at many different things, including your credit score. It doesn't mean that the bank does not wanna develop its own models, but credit score is an integral uh, input into the model. So similarly, security scorecard scores are integral inputs into the models of many insurance companies, the models of many companies who report to the board um, about how they're doing. But we provide this integral view of outside in across a data set of millions of companies, which allows companies to also compare how they do against the industry, against competition. And if they want to develop their models, it's a it's a great thing. We only like, you know, we only welcome it. Great starting point if they want to go deeper. It's sort of like the beginner, intermediate, advanced method of risk measurement. Okay, let's talk a little bit more generally about security and risk. We, within the last year, saw a wholesale change in how businesses operate. And that obviously affects companies' risk. What are some of the elements of cyber risk that businesses need to be thinking about now? given the current operational models and as we head into the new year, whether based on how we're working or things you see in the future that might happen, whether it's geographic risk, political risk, um, any other kind of risk that might emerge, that's, that's something that you see trending or think might be trending in the near future. Yeah, so this year, so a hyper acceleration um, of everything. You know, companies, including us and including other companies out there, probably made 10 times as many decisions this year than any other year. And um, I think when it applies to cyber risk or just running a business in general, I'd like to say that it's not the smartest 
or the strongest that are going to thrive and survive, but the quickest. The quickest to embrace the new reality and the quickest to adapt. From a cybersecurity frontier, um, many people are now working from home. That means that the systems that chief security officers used to gain insight into anomalous events within their environments are no longer as effective because now you have home traffic, you have home systems which create a lot of noise and limit the visibility for uh, CIOs and CISOs to understand the risk within the environment. So this really accelerated the exponential increase in attack surface. Uh, now, CIOs and CISOs no longer have to worry just about their own data center. They have to worry about the home environments of employees within the company. They have to worry about the third party risk proliferation because you could be storing your documents in a, in a cloud. You could be sending your legal documents to an outside law firm and you're doing everything right to go protect your company, but then your law firm gets hacked and you end up on a cover of New York Times for the wrong reasons, because your information got stolen. Um, 60 plus percent of data breaches today involve third parties. So as I look into 2021, I think the third party risk will definitely be a big topic for many CIOs and CISOs to address. I think that quantification and measuring risk is going to be integral because you cannot improve what you cannot measure. And today, CIOs and CISOs are using too many fragmented solutions. They don't use any data-driven KPIs to know how they do compared to competition. So third-party risk, measuring cybersecurity and communicating to the board, making sure that the board is aligned uh, along with you will be a second important bucket. And the third bucket will be cyber insurance. The ways to mitigate risk, the ways to accept risk, and the ways to transfer risk, and I think insurance will really continue becoming more of a must-have, especially in today's environment. Interesting. Um, let's touch on those first two, third party first, um, because that's something that Security Scorecard focuses on. How can a company realistically measure third party risk if they don't own those systems, if they don't manage and control those systems? Where's the influence? What can they do? Well, that's precisely the uh, pain point which kept me up awake at night when I was a CIO and CISO and worked in companies like Goldman Sachs, Oracle, and others. Um, one day when I was a CISO, my CFO showed up on my doorstep and said, Alex, we're going to sign up for an e-commerce fraud mitigation solution. And I said, okay, that sounds good. Do you have like a vulnerability scan for that system? And he handed to me a perfectly looking vulnerability scan. So I signed on a dotted line. And just as we started integrating with the systems of that company, to my dismay, I discovered unencrypted credit card data belonging to other users. And this to me was like an oh crap moment, which made me realize that the way people assess third party risk is fundamentally broken. Seven years ago, people either ignored it and pretended the problem is not there, or they used pen and paper questionnaires where you would trust the answers that people would put on paper about their cybersecurity posture, or they would rely on intrusive security audits through consultants or vulnerability scanners, which were static a point in time. Uh, they only gave you a snapshot of what's today. They did not tell you what's going to happen tomorrow. And then you had to go ask permission and consent of companies to go get it. So we felt that this is fundamentally a huge problem and we need to address it. And that's what really led us to create security scorecard where we asked the question, why can there be a way to non-intrusively without installing or deploying anything to measure the cybersecurity hygiene of a company from outside? For example, you could go take a look at the website of a company and you notice that at the bottom of a site it says copyright 2005. It's 2020, so you just discovered the company has not updated its website for 15 years. And we figured out hundreds of more sophisticated signals that uh, you can pick up non-intrusively, malware beaconing outside of a system, misconfigured endpoint systems, expired SSL certificates. And we figured out how to pick up all this information of what's happening behind the firewall, non-intrusively from outside, and to benchmark companies to each other. And so uh, I think the future is really going to be utilizing the security ratings uh, 
that we provide and a couple of other players in the market provide to really start measuring and making data-driven decisions. You would not think about buying a bond or giving a loan to a company without having a credit score. So why would people today uh, do business with companies when they have no idea if they're diligent or not? So I really think the future of third-party risk and just how companies report to the board, how companies vet their investment targets, M&A targets, it's really going to be through data-driven ratings. And we envision a transformation where every company in the world is going to be using our scores to communicate internally, to hold other companies accountable. And we're actually seeing this happen already. We're seeing that over 30% of our customers and more uh, are beginning to bake into their legal contracts a mandate to have a minimum security score, just like they mandate an uptime requirement for a company. And at this point, it no longer becomes a nice to have, it becomes a must have. And so uh, in the next couple of years, this type of, uh, this type of ratings are going to be as important as credit ratings, according to uh, according to Gartner. So that's interesting because an insurance company wouldn't take on a business for a cyber insurance policy without some kind of idea about their risk and their third party risk. So having it baked into the system is certainly something that companies need to think about. And then you also mentioned board reporting to boards because they're the ones making these types of decisions, whether it's about taking out cyber insurance or partnerships or M&As. So what are some of the mistakes you've seen security teams make when they're trying to either quantify or communicate risk to board members or non-technical executives? Um. So there's an expression, CISOs are from Mars and board members are from Venus, right? They just don't speak the same language. A CISO might go present to the board and tell them, you know, I installed Akamai Prolexic on 10.1.3.1 slash 24 network range. And the board is going to look at the CISO and say, what the heck did he just say? When he should have said, I invested $200,000 into a solution to mitigate potential website outage that could cost us millions of dollars due to a denial of service attack. So people need to speak the same language. The job of a CISO is not just to drive security leadership, but also to be an evangelist, to explain how security helps the businesses run better and more efficiently and to translate it into a language that other non-technical people are going to understand. That's mistake number one, speak the same language. The second mistake is it's better to have fewer metrics than too many metrics. You know, just, you know, common with 200 type of different KPIs and metrics um, confuses people. You need to pick two to three important good metrics, focus on them relentlessly and then drive them. And then the third part is the metrics need to be objective. There needs to be a transparent methodology about how they're computed, and they should not be vanity metrics. Uh, people, for example, if you go to people and say, hey, our antivirus solution or our endpoint protection caught 100,000 potential intrusion attempts in the last month. That doesn't tell you much. How many, how many intrusion attempts did you miss? I know that you told me you caught 100,000, but maybe you missed a couple. So it doesn't tell you much. So the metrics need to be objective. They need to be non-vanity metrics. There needs to be a context about what's considered acceptable and what's considered good. Um, and then, you know, just like when you talk about PNL or you talk about your sales and marketing spend, the boards of directors could go and compare to other companies and say, hey, at a company in your stage, What's the average percentage spent on sales and marketing? You know, what, what does the rest of the industry do? Are we overspending? Are we underspending? Are we more efficient, less efficient? Similarly, the same type of a dialogue needs to start at the board level. And uh, security ratings, you know, is a way to start that dialogue. Again, you know, there's many type of metrics, um, but without metrics, we cannot go have an informed dialogue as an industry. I think that's really good insight because 
there's a lot of data. There's so much data a CISO or their team could present, but it also has to be about context. You know, when a CEO or a board sees a big breach in the news, they might go to their security team and say, could this happen to me? The answer is always yes. But the real question is, will this happen to me? And so that's about context. And that changes the equation. It's about probability. And risk isn't something new in businesses. There were plenty of risk factors to businesses before businesses were digital. So the idea that boards of directors and executives don't understand risk, well, that's not accurate. They may not understand cybersecurity risk, but they understand risk. And so it's tying those pieces together. So one last question before we wrap up here, Alex. What are customers most surprised about when they start using Security court Scorecard? What do they see? What What is their aha moment? Yeah, thank you, Katie. So um, the three things that we hear consistently from customers and prospects when they dig in deeper at Security Scorecard. The first thing we hear is, wow, I did not know that you can find out so much useful information about what's happening behind the firewall from outside, right? People don't realize that we can pick up so many interesting details from outside non-intrusively about anybody. So they're really surprised by the breadth and depth of the information. The second part they're surprised about is they realize that we actually give them very concrete advice about how to improve a score, that it's not just a score, but it's a journey. And so we actually allow any company completely for free zero dollars to go claim their profile and teach them completely for free to find out their attack surface to find out the issues they have in the environment and to go improve a score and so people are surprised they think sometimes when we give them a bad score that it's like a stigma and they can't do anything about but they're usually surprised when they realize that we tell them exactly what they can do to go from a d to an a like we tell them exactly the steps they need to do to become more resilient and a third part that they're surprised about is when they start rolling it and using it in their environments, how much time and how much money they save. We have a robust set of different type of workflows, integrations and API, and we see customers who completely integrated within the environment, never touch the system afterwards, it's all automated. It saves them millions and millions of dollars and we're doing it at a tiny fraction of a cost. So. Automation is bucket number one that they're very surprised on. Number two, how much data and information we show from outside about what's happening behind the firewall. And the third part is that they can get access to their scorecard and figure out how to improve it for free. And that it's about the journey and not so much about the score. Excellent. Thank you so much for that overview and for your comments. It's been a fun conversation today. For everybody watching and listening, thanks for tuning in. We're really happy that we had the opportunity to introduce you to or refresh your knowledge on Security Scorecard. Alex, appreciate the time as always. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you very much.